Admit. Yes. Professor Leach, can you can you talk to us to test? Yeah, sure. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. It's low. Uh, we, we can hear you, but it's not as oh. high volume as we wanted. So um, let me think. Um, can I just, I'll fine. just let me just disconnect my microphone and see if that's the issue. So I'll just dis yes. disconnect. Fine, but I think that's as loud as it goes. Yes, can, we, we like maximize the volume on our side. So let's see. Okay, let me. Yes. Now I have connected yeah. the microphone again. Can, does that make a difference? Sounds good. Just like there's so much like other sound. We have. We are in a big, huge space with our studio, so maybe it's our problem. But we can hear him fine at least, right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. This, this should be maximum oh. volume. This is max. Oh, yeah. Is that Perfect. working? No, this is better, right? Yeah, yeah it's better. It's, okay. it's good now. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Um, our class, thank you so much for joining. And thank you, Professor Leach, for accepting this invitation. Uh, we have big fans of you. <laughs> we have Yammer there. We have Matt Craven. We have people you reviewed their projects in uh, Daniel's class, right? Uh, they they really kind of uh, they're excited about your lecture, and um, they're buying your book for 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 your live signature, right? When you come, so <laughs> I'm collecting books. So when I meet you, I have so many books with me for signatures. Yeah, I got the book as well. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. Okay. And, well, write a nice uh, review. I, I don't think anyone's written a re review yet. So write something nice to set it off in the right place. <laughs> if someone slams it, I, I mean, there are going to be people who are going to slam it, of course, but there we go. No, it's a great book. It's the first book on AI and architecture. It will always stay the first book, right? So that's it. It's a, it's it, a great book. <laughs> it's technically not the first book. Emmanuel Co. produced one in, in Singapore, but it's it's not been distributed. So, um, okay. Um, yes. But yeah. We know you. We know the book. It's more important for us. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Neil, I don't need to introduce you. You are a public figure, right? I don't know. You introduce yourself your way, but they know oh. you. They can Google you, right? They, we just watched mm. your YouTube videos on AI. They love them. You speak nicely more than myself when I introduced AI last class. <laughs> but they Maybe love something, them. Watching your YouTube something we channel. could mention, Shamin, is that uh, Neil is behind the the beginning of the Digital Futures Global Initiative, which is something really huge that happened in the last two years. And uh, for all the students, yeah. they can go ahead and look up online yeah. the Digital Futures website. It was a global conference and flash workshop yeah. event, which happened in 2020 and 2021. Yeah. I think with more than 10,000 participants, correct? So uh, yeah. that's great. Um, great to well, have I, you here. I just to say that we, we've now launched um, an Arabic and a Farsi channel and a Spanish one coming soon and also a Russian and Portuguese one. The Arabic channel for some reason went went viral. We had 20,000, almost 20,000 views on that. So anyway, no, but I want to just want to thank Shamin and, and Manos and, uh, and Daniel actually above all, because uh, you guys have also been contributing to the whole initiative. Um, uh, and I would also say that um, this is like a just an aside, but um, Shamin was, uh, I gave a workshop in, in Dessau, in Dia, when I, where I used to teach and I gave a workshop and Shamin was on that workshop. And so I've been tracking her, um, her career. Um, I remember her coming up to me outside the Bauhaus and asking, uh, saying she wanted to do a PhD and then asking uh, where she could do it. And uh, anyway, she went to Texas and now she's with you guys um, and you're very lucky to have her. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Maybe she's the new the new Zaha. Who knows? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think yeah. you're very lucky. I would say one thing is that you're very lucky to have the three of them, you know, um, Daniel, Manos, and Shamin, because you don't know this because it's the only school of architecture you know. But FAU is actually becoming a world center for AI. In fact, Southern Florida as a whole is becoming a world center for AI. At FIU, we have a, a DDES program um, that uh, in which we have two of the with several of the world leading experts in AI. So it's it's kind of, you don't know this, but this is very unusual. But I also say about Dessa, where Shamin was, is I began to discover there that, uh, that the foundations of digital futures were in that, because I discovered that actually that um, 
I mean, Deso is a place where you go when you can't afford to, it's the fees for, for, for the GSD and, and, and so on. And what I discovered there was actually that the talent is evenly distributed around the world. The top 2% of any culture, any country is, are good. Uh, and, it's, and, and being good doesn't depend on your capacity to, um, to pay the fees for the GSD or the AA and so on. So Digital Futures was come out, somehow came out of that, the idea that somehow we needed to, to share educational ideas um, around the world. Anyway, let me let me let me start. Um, so this is actually your guinea pigs because I'm going to give a series of lectures all over the world, literally all over the world, in the next few weeks about this particular book. That tomorrow I'm giving one in in India, and I just want to try and uh, use this session to go and sort of to to test out <laughs> whether I got my my material together. I mean, the, the problem when you've just done a book is there's so much material, and how do you then? Uh, just uh, uh, tease out the kind of key questions. And I'm going to start by going back to the very first lecture I gave about AI, I think the first one anyway, um, from 2019. Um, uh, and I certainly gave it to Acadia, where Shamin was um, in, uh, in Texas. Um, Do robots dream of digital sheep? Um, and that, as you probably know, is um, is based on the uh, book by Philip K. Dick, um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which itself was the, uh, the, 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 the novel on which um, the movie Blade Runner was based. Um, so I want to go back to actually the beginning of, of 2019, the very first day of 2019. And you can see the difference between Los Angeles. This was a meme that was shared um, on New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, um, uh, 2019, um, which showed LA suddenly being transformed um, from one day to the next, from LA to the city of Blade Runner. Um, now I'm referring here not, not to the, the second version, the, the sequel, Blade Runner 2049, but Blade Runner itself, um, and uh, which is the, I think in many ways, a much stronger movie, but anyway, uh, Blade Runner itself, and I'm, I'm, I don't, I, I can't assume that everybody knows about the original Blade Runner movie, but it became a cult movie for architects, and I think that everybody, uh, every architectural student needs to 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 look at the original Blade Runner movie that was um, uh, released uh, in 1982. The director was Ridley Scott, a British director who had trained as an art student, and I think the whole all the visual effects that you get in 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 Blade Runner. And the richness of the visual effects are, come from his um, his background. So, for those of you who don't know the story of Blade Runner, it's about um, uh, uh, replicants, um, about uh, particularly six uh, replicants. Replicants are bioengineered uh, robots, and they're designed um, to work in the harsh conditions of the off-world colonies, um, where and and, be, and for that reason, they are. Um, uh, considerably more durable, strong um, than human beings, and in the case of the uh, the, the, the latest model, Nexus Seven, um, and here we can see um, uh, uh, Roy, Roy Batty on the right hand side, played by Rudger Hauer, and uh, Chrissy here on the left hand side. Uh, Rud, uh, 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 <clears throat> Roy Batty is, is a Nexus Seven, the most sophisticated of the models, and because they are so potentially dangerous, um, because they're so capable. They're given a limited lifespan of four years as a kind of safety measure. Um, and what happens um, in the story is that uh, there's a mutiny, and uh, uh, six of these uh, replicants come back to Earth uh, with the express idea of trying to extend their life because they're coming to the end of their four years and they want to um, extend their life. So they come back, and of course, um, uh, what makes uh, that what so, and, and uh, this is Harrison Ford who plays Deckard in the movie. Who's, he's the Blade Runner, who is, whose aim, whose role, whose responsibility is he's kind of policeman, bounty hunter, and his responsibility is to uh, retire, that is to say, kill or uh, annihilate these, these replicants. Um, and the reason perhaps why they're so dangerous is that they look absolutely identical to, um, uh, um, uh, to, to human beings, which of course makes it very easy on the one hand of the movie to, to cast them, because obviously human beings play them, but they have to have a very elaborate a test called the Voigt Camp test to try and detect whether they're um, uh, replicants or not. And this is um, the, the test that's been uh, um, 
being conducted, they look at the kind of the reflexes of the eye and they ask some questions to test out their empathy. Um, and, uh, and this particular case, of course, is one who actually does shoot the person and kills the person. Um, uh, well, no, she not kills it, but shoots the person who is, um, uh, who is uh, uh, interviewing him. What is interesting about this is the guy. The guy survives, but he goes on a on a on a, 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 a metal lung, a, a kind of ventilator, which kind of, in some senses, reminds you a bit of kind of COVID. The other thing about COVID is that this actually takes place. The whole movie takes place. We find out um, on the 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 nineteenth to twenty first of November two thousand and nineteen. Now, by a curious coincidence, COVID was first discovered on the seventeenth of November. Um, uh, 2019 uh, in Wuhan and of course COVID itself needs to be tested and COVID itself is also potentially lethal and this I guess is the interesting kind of question and it feeds into the question about AI because AI itself is actually quite difficult to detect it's actually invisible and we have a test again the Turing test to see whether uh, it, it convincingly passes as human so there's a whole series of different kind of analogies going on but what I found also very interesting about the movie is how prescient it was in the sense this is uh, Roy Batty take, uh, uh, taking on e, uh, Elon, uh, Eldon Tyrell, uh, Tyrell um, at chess. Um, and in 1997, um, it, uh, Deep Blue beat um, Gary Kasparov, the, then, the Russian then world champion at chess. Um, so it, it was it, it was predicting how good. I'm kind of reading these 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 replicants as kind of AI um, bots, as it were. It kind of predicted that as well. And then I just thought about this morning, but it's kind of interesting because um, uh, this is Eldon uh, Tyrell, and I gave it a little slip earlier on. I gave it away. I called him uh, Elon Tyrell, but you know, basically, he's the guy who sets up the whole Tyrell organization, manufactures these replicants, and if you just remove the word, the letter D from his name you got Elon Tyrell, which is in itself kind of interesting for another reason I'll talk about in a second. So the movie gets some things completely wrong. This is Rachel smoking. Um, well, in 1982, people did smoke indoors, but, uh, but 2019, that clearly got out of fashion. So that's one of the aspects that the movie got wrong. Um, but then some of the aspects it did get right, it's worth thinking about this. I mean, we don't have replicants, but we do have AI infiltrating our society, and we often don't know where it is because effectively it's it's invisible. Um, we uh, we don't have flying cars, but we do have maglev trains, and we do have drones and other sort of equipment. We don't have the Tyrell Corporation, but we do have Elon Musk. We do have um, uh, 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 SpaceX, Tesla. We have uh, Microsoft. We have Amazon. We got Google. All these high tech kind of companies. Um, it, uh, we do have them. And when it comes to um, you know these kind of these screens on buildings, um, uh, advertisements and so on, I would say if anything, the vision in uh, in Blade Runner is a little bit nostalgic because if you go to Shanghai, there's even more than this. So in many ways, I would say that Blade Runner proved to be extraordinarily prescient um, about the vision of the future. And of course, um, in 2019. Uh, uh, SpaceX re released the Cybertruck, which of course was modeled on um, the, the vehicle, both the vehicle that appeared in the, in the first Blade Runner and also in the second Blade Runner movie. So um, it's worth contemplating um, how that happened. I want to, um, just with that and as a background, I want to just uh, introduce um, uh, this figure, uh, Refik Aladol, who has been central to the, um, the introduction of AI um, into me the media, the world of media art, and also into architecture. He's not an architect; um, he's a media artist. But he uses buildings as both his canvas and, and, as it were, his material, because a lot of his work is based on on data that comes from from buildings. And when uh, Refik was a young boy, I think six or seven years old or something, back in Turkey in Istanbul, um, his mother gave him gave him a, a video because it was videos in those days. Um, of uh, um, a video cassette of, of Blade Runner. And this had a profound effect on the young uh, Anna Refik. And he, he eventually, in 2012, he came to um, Los Angeles and uh, to study on the MFA program at UCLA, where he now teaches. And the first thing that he did um, on landing at LAX was to get a taxi. Um, to go and see his favorite building. This was 
the building by his hero, Frank Gehry, the, the Walt Disney Concert Hall. And he took a taxi at two o'clock in the morning to downtown LA, expecting to see this. Um, but what he saw was this, um, which in many ways surprised him because he expected it to be spotlit and things, but actually it was completely asleep. Um, the building was asleep. And one of the visions that they then, <clears throat> at that point um, formulated was the idea that um, he wanted to bring the building alive. Um, and that happened in 2018, October 2018, when he was invited to, um, to uh, create an installation, um, to a projection onto the facade of the Walt Disney Concert Hall to mark the 100th anniversary of I'm going to, sorry, um, of, uh, the, um, uh, of, of, the, of, of the, the uh, LA Philharmonic. Uh, and what he did was to take all the data, all the records, all the archives of uh, the LA Philharmonic and process them. Um, and then there were a series of um, operations, shall we say, uh, where he went through a sequence. The first one was memory, then there was consciousness, and then there was dreaming. Whether these terms are exactly what humans mean by this term is another question. We'll look at that in a moment later on. Um, but effectively, he processed all this kind of information and projected this onto the building. It was done um, with the help of Google AMI, of Google Artist Machine Intelligence Group, that's um, led by Blaise Aguirre Arcos, who have been responsible for supporting a number of uh, AI based artists over the years uh, um, and uh, also with some AI sound artists and the whole thing became a kind of hallucination um, of uh, uh, of the whole thing, a celebration of 100 years of um, uh, the operations of, of the uh, LA um, Philharmonic. Um, now, this is not this is just projection onto architecture. It's not necessarily architecture itself, but this was, I think, a hugely significant moment in the history of uh, AI and media art. Um, uh, it wasn't the first piece of, of, of um, AI generated art, but it was enormously sophisticated and it effectively catapulted uh, Refik Anadol into the, the global um, <clears throat> consciousness. And he became something of a, a superstar um, as a result of that. And alongside this, I'll just simply say, I don't want to play it because I'll get banned for copyright reasons, but um, there was some music that was composed and I can possibly just play you a little five second snippet, I think 10 seconds and I, I blow the, the copyright thing, but here we go. Okay. Um, so the next step in the uh, the, the, the process was to actually engage with architecture itself. And I had, in 2019, I had set up uh, a potential collaboration with a Google AMI and with Zaha Hadid Architects for the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, um, and which was a kind of dream team, um, absolute dream team. And we're going to bring Refik into what we thought, we think we, he should be able to hallucinate buildings. Well. First of all, we didn't get anywhere. Um, we didn't even get shortlisted, which is just astonishing to me. Um, there were there wasn't even a short shortlist. There were nine on the shortlist, and uh, uh, but um, but never mind. Mind actually, what happened was that before even the Venice Biennale was happened, of course, it was delayed. Um, we Revic had already hallucinated buildings. Had already been using this. This is a, a style GAN, and I'll talk more and explain what a GAN is. Genitive adversarial mechanism generative adversarial network at a moment. But what is astonishing, that based on a data set of Zahadid images, he begins to hallucinate things that become absolutely quintessentially Zaha-like. And at a certain moment, you're going to see that particular moment. And there you have it. Uh, and that, in fact, was the image that we used um, on the front cover of the book. Um, it is an historic image to, to, in many ways, in the sense it's one of the first um, I don't know if you call it a building, but a, a, a hallucinated image of a design by an architect based on a data set of works by that particular architect. Um, so this is the book. Um, it's actually the, the, the first of two books. Um, 
I won't go into the story, but there are actually there's two books. One is about the the how amazing um, AI, and one is about how the dark side of AI, the, the, how terrifying it is. Um, so this has a white cover, the other one has a black cover. One has the is the angel, one is the devil. Um, and I would simply say that the dark one, which I'm I'm st writing now or I've started writing, is not about how evil AI is, because AI is not evil. It's just a tool. Uh, of course, people can use it for evil purposes just as you can use a kitchen knife to go and murder someone, but you can also use a kitchen knife for um, to cut your vegetables. Um, but it is, you know, I think it's 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 it is either terrifying. Uh, it's either amazing or it's terrifying. Um, I, I think it's terrifyingly amazing. It's actually when you get to know what AI can do. Um, and this will be part of a second talk that I'm, I'm also giving. Um, uh, you can see that it is it is it's going to leave us behind in many ways, but um, I won't go into that now. The other uh, book that we that's coming out, uh, well, that one, so this one came out in December the 9th, 16th, 16th in um, in in London. Bloomsbury published it. They're the Harry Potter publishers, um, and we had no book launch because it was all shut down because of COVID, of a micron variant, and so on. But there's this book then coming out in May. There's also this an aid issue of AD that I uh, guest edited with Matthias Del Campo, and they actually work well together because the first book has actually got the information in it. It's trying to describe what AI is, and give a history of AI, and talk about the background, how AI appeared in art first, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, but very few images, because in order to have images, it's it's expensive. Um, we only have eight pages of color images. Um, and But the AD has, has is basically all images and very little text. The, the, the articles are only 2,000 words long. It's kind of superficial, but the images are great. And the two work well together because the, they're, they're complementary. Um, uh, um, anyway, um, so the question I want to address today is basically, um, can machines dream? Uh, do robots dream of digital sheep? Um, and it's an interesting question. There are many people who have kind of commented this on the very beginning. Uh, uh, Alan Turing uh, had a view on it. Um, um, Ada Lovelace had a view on it. But let me just quote Makoto Se Watanabe, who is, I think, and it gives offers the, the, the standard view, at least it used to be around, um, the idea that machines can do certain things very well, but it's, they certainly can't dream. People are the only ones who can create an image that, that does not yet exist. Machines do not have dreams. Now, to his credit, uh, Watanabe actually acknowledges that eventually the time will come when machines can dream. Um, I think he actually, when he published this in 2017, we, we published this already, they could dream. So um, I think that, uh, um, okay. Um, so let me just explain how this process happens. On the left-hand side, you have um, the, I mean, a kind of new, I guess we call it neural network with a neural network with the brain. On the right-hand side, we have uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, neural network of, um, uh, of, of deep learning, of connectionism AI, which is, I would say, modeled on the brain or inspired by the brain. It doesn't replicate the brain. But what is so interesting, it is uncannily close in the way that it operates to how the brain works, even though it is only loosely modeled on the brain. So on the left hand side, for those of you who studied biology, you've got uh, uh, neurons and synapses um, uh, of the brain. And here you have this is a new called a neuron and these are called synapses. Um, and what they are governed by weights that control the flow of information from one layer to the next. You have um, in the middle, you have these hidden layers and you can have up to a thousand hidden layers. Um, and that's why deep learning is called deep learning because the number of layers and what tends to happen is that you process it um, from one one well, from left to right feed forward as it's called and you process information and you use it for example to recognize um, uh, a picture um, as in facial recognition and so on um, uh, and i would say just one final thing about this is, is to say that actually some people even do not use the word neuron. Melanie Mitchell uses the word unit because she thinks that these, that neuron is 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 confusing because these things are only loosely modeled on the brain. But most people refer to them as neur neurons, and these are referred to as neural networks. So what happens then is that is that you get a picture of a bird, and then it processes its way through this whole sequence, and eventually it says that's a bird. Well, and that was kind of 
quite a breakthrough in many ways um, that happened in the um, with the kind of the whole connectionism deep learning revolution that happened in the I guess from about 2006 onwards that transformed everything. This was the kind of uh, the the real breakthrough. But then the the next question, the holy grail, was how do you work the other way? In other words, you can take an image and you can recognize it, but can and and, and give it a a label or concept or something. But could you work the other way? Could you take start from the word bird and generate an image of a bird? Um, and uh, uh, the, what was interesting is one of the Google um, engineers, uh, a, a Russian guy called Morgansev, uh, was playing around with this, playing with kind of, I guess, uh, um, kind of computational neuroscience and discovered that if you actually uh, process the information the opposite way, you could actually start, you could actually use the same technique, the same uh, convolutional neural net, but start, go the opposite way and start with the word bird and or cat or dog or whatever it was and generate an image of the cut and this led to what's referred to as deep dream um which caused something of a sensation a sensation because it was kind of um uh, a slightly trippy image um uh, 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 that, that would emerge which was completely invariant to pose and the reason why it's invariant to pose is some of the information that has been processed one way has to be kind of compressed you lose some of the information so when you go in the opposite direction um you can't really control it but what is fascinating from a theoretical perspective, and uh, I'm primarily a kind of theorist, is that what it suggests is these two modalities are, in a sense, their opposite. In other words, the idea of generation or creation or something, <clears throat> whatever you call it, um, production of, of, of visual images, is the opposite of interpretation. In other words, you can think that maybe that the, the artist creator is a different modality to the theorist or the interpreter or the historian who is working the opposite direction. And it's no surprise, therefore, that most, um, most uh, uh, theorists are not necessarily designers and most designers are not theorists um, because it seems, this seems to suggest that they're opposite modalities. And this is, in a sense, the key question that I'm gonna be asking in this lecture is to what extent can we see um, the way that the human mind through the mirror of AI, what, is, what can AI tell us about how we as humans operate. What can artificial intelligence tell us about what intelligence itself is? It doesn't prove anything, but there's a clear analogy going on there. The next step in the process was the development of what are called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, which were developed by Ian Simpson, 2014. And this really uh, controlled this system, uh, the whole the process in a much more um, uh, uh, rigorous way. So what you get with a with a GAN is uh, two different um, neural networks. Um, one is a generator and one is a discriminator. Um, and what's happening is that you're taking random noise, then your, your generator is producing images that the discriminator is comparing against a data set and it is either convinced by it or not. So it's kind of a bit like the Turing test in some senses. It's, it's examining it. And basically, if it's not convinced, it rejects it. Um, and if it is convinced, it accepts it. So it's a bit like a kind of art forger and an art critic, you know, the art critic saying whether or not uh, he or she is convinced by uh, whether a, a kind of an imitation of, of, of Van Gogh is actually Van Gogh. So that's the process that's going on. One is being tested against the other and they train each other. So the, the and the discriminator effectively trains the generator. Um, and uh, eventually you can you can take the discriminator away and the generator will just keep generating hopefully images <clears throat> that meets that standard. So it also, in some senses, replicate the way that we as human beings, um, uh, that designers are trained to be critical. If you see the, the, the kind of discriminator being a criticality uh, and the, 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 the theorist is trained to be creative. Those, these two modalities that we saw in Deep Dream actually play off one another, one could say, in, to some extent in, in uh, architectural, the architectural process itself. Um, or at least it would seem to suggest that's the case. We can't say anything else apart from that. But what GANs have managed to produce were um, some, and, and there have been a series of sequence of these. There's been, they started off with, we went into progressive GANs and into style GANs, and there's style GANs one, two, and now three. They're getting better and better. And this is one of the, I think, progressive GANs, so some of the early ones, which uh, produce these astonishingly realistic uh, uh, faces. Um, they're all fakes. They're all fakes, in other words, and also, in some ways, it's challenging uh, uh, Watanabe's comment that, that, a, that a machine cannot produce an image that does not yet exist. None of these exist. None of these exist. These are just simply hallucinated faces 
based on a data set of um, Hollywood stars. Um, and what makes maybe faces easy is they're sort of vaguely symmetrical. You've got two eyes on either side uh, and so on, you know, uh, one on either side. And, and uh, But this was the first sort of in incursion into that area. And eventually, of course, we moved into the realm of architecture. Um, <clears throat> and this is a um, a, a program that was developed by X Cool by Wen Yu He, who is a she's um, on the uh, DDES, the Doctor of Design program at FIU down the road. Well, we're all online, so we're not anywhere actually. Um, uh, and she has a company called X Cool. She used to work for Rem Coolhaas uh, at OMA. X Cool means X Coolhaas. It also means it's the kind of street language for hyper cool. Um, and she produced this buildings hallucinated buildings buildings that do not yet exist um and uh and and some of them i mean they're 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 kind of glitchy and imperfect but um uh this is what's happening this is basically the state of the art uh the leading company probably in the world i would say at the moment in terms of using deep learning to <clears throat> hallucinate architecture um and of course, it's based on a, on, a, on a, a data set of modernist buildings. And what you get, of course, if you take modernist buildings, you get modernist buildings. It uh, StyleGans interpolates based on um, the, the data from, from, from the input of the, the data. Um, um, and not totally perfect, they're a little glitchy, but they're on their way. And the important point about deep learning is it improves over time. Now, you could say, well, of course, that's just boring and uh, it's just straightforward uh, rectilinear modernist architecture. Um, but actually, um, uh, hang on a second. Um, and I hope this is going to work. Is this working? Um, yeah. Um, this is more recent work. This is when you uh, showing us they entered a competition um, uh, for uh, actually the 200 architects uh, competed in this competition. And it was they 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 used AI to generate um, a form, a much more Gary-like form, shall we say, not at all rectilinear. In fact, they started off with rectilinear, and through a, a process of, of, of optimization, this is based on wind chill factor and environmental concerns. They started generating forms that are actually more Gary than anything else, and that, to my mind, is a sign of where this is going. Um, I should have put that on repeat because I think it's worth repeating. I'm going to go I'm going to gay. This is is just a hint of these things. Um, and uh, um, yeah. uh, so you start off with the rectilinear one, then it gradually breaks it down and optimizes and discovers, in fact, that some of the, the forms that we come up with are um, far more scary. Uh, this. Uh, that's a glimpse of the future. It's not incorporated into their standard package, how they operate, but it clearly will be at some point. So, um, and I don't need to tell you guys because you know, because you've got had Daniel working with you, um, that uh, of course there are other people as well who are working on this. Um, uh, uh, most significantly, and I think this is the state of the art in the world at the moment, um, uh, Deep Himmelblau, which is which Daniel himself, um, was behind a, a hugely sophisticated um, project that draws upon the the data set of all previous Kopf Milblau um, buildings to hallucinate other possible buildings. Um, we don't know all the details. Daniel doesn't give us every all the details, but all I would say is that this is a glimpse of 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 of, uh, of what we can do with it in, in terms of progressive practice. Um, uh, the, the limitations of this, firstly, it's operating in 2D. It's not 3D. 3D is quite a challenge for for, um, uh, for deep learning. Um, and secondly, you can't really control it. Um, I remember showing some of this work to to Tom Main, um, or some of my student works, Tom Main. He said, well, how do, what do I do with that? I can't control it. Um, but nonetheless, you can see that there is something here that is, that is going to be hugely significant. And some of these um, renderings, which were in both books, um, I think are, uh, <clears throat> give you a sense of um, of what you can do with this. Uh, um, yeah. And then this particular one, I think is interesting as video because it's based on, a, it's a, it's a, it's a um, cycle GAN. So it works with two unpaired data sets, um, one clouds and one buildings by data set of buildings by, 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 by Corp Himmelblau. And of course the name Himmelblau means it's got, it's kind of, it's a play on words. It's Himmelbau, it's a kind of building in the sky, but it's 
Himmelblau, which is uh, which is blue a blue sky. So it's kind of blue sky thinking, building the sky. And these particular um, cloud images make a lot of sense in terms of their project. Anyway, um, so uh, and of course Daniel himself, you've you've seen this work. Uh, um, just you should really appreciate Daniel. Daniel is 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 astonishing, and uh, he's done his own research. This is the uh, into uh, the Ga Gaudi's um, Sagrada Familia, where it get, he's been using. Um, uh, cycle gans again and pairing up um, a video of a walk through a forest with with images from the uh, from from Gaudi and extrapolating. In other words, instead of interpolating, you're actually extrapolating because you're effectively breeding in a sense one off against another. Um, and I think in the next sequence you'll see the uh, um, the the, uh, the 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 video of the here we are the video of the the walk through the forest. This is part of what was uh, that was the, the, the data that was fed into it anyway so and alongside that uh, we're now getting um, much easier ways of beginning to hallucinate and generate uh, build, uh, buildings this is a design by um, uh, uh, Giovanna Pelaca who's part of the digital futures uh, team she's now teaching in Peru but this is part of the digital futures workshop it's a combination of clip and VQGAN, and CLIP is, uh, comes out of um, OpenAI's uh, GPT-3, immensely powerful um, um, uh, computer, the uh, uh, natural language processing computer. And what it's doing is basically pairing up images with, um, <clears throat> with, with labels, with, with um, descriptions, um, with text. Um, so you give it a prompt. And it, it basically hallucinates this prompt. The prompt that was used for this, there was a, a background prompt, which was to say about three architects, Yan Sung Ma, uh, Tom Main, and, and uh, Wolf Pricks. And then the, then the, the, the main prompt was the um, uh, futuristic Indian temple. And I won't go into necessarily the, 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 the mechanics of this, of how VQ GAN relates to, to CLIP, but suffice it to say that everybody now can hallucinate these astonishing um, buildings. It's from that situation in 2019 when um, we were rejected for the, for the Venice Biennale to where we are now, where this is the thing that is, you know, uh, firing up the imagination of young designers um, with the AI revolution has happened and we are, it is, it is in process and it's just producing, you know, some really quite uh, extraordinary um, images. Um, and I guess this is the point about AI, it's every week, every day, something new appears. Uh, and this was too late to be incorporated in the first book because of the processing, the, the publication process, but is incorporated in the AD um, and and so on. I mean, the book is going to be out of date. It is out of date already, but, um, but there we go. <clears throat> and alongside that, alongside the kind of question about whether you can be creative using AI, there are also, I would say, other mechanisms whereby you can creatively deploy AI with other tools to open up um, new forms of creativity this is um a project that's done by uh, done by um casey ream and uh, and his team and damian damian jovanovich and lydia um krakovich um and also lauren michelin was working with with uh, casey ream uh, for the new campo marcia and these are ai driven um bots that are as it were navigating the space colonizing the space or um inhabiting the space uh, and the, the building itself is all the, the the architectural landscape is is generated uh through AI, ai itself so uh we're seeing something new emerging um astonishing you know really this is the new domain i don't know if you call it the metaverse or what but this is the new domain that is appearing um and the other one i would say that i uh, i really like from um uh coming out of sayak uh, is uh Damian Ivanovich and Lydia Krakovich, who have a company called uh, a group, uh, um, have a, who work together, um, and this is on the Dream Estate, where these AI-powered uh, um, uh, figures are, uh, are are navigating this space. Um, I don't know if I got the sound here. When we feel a thing. We are not compelled to think of it, but merely perceive it. The 
feeling we feel of the thing is an instinctive feature of our personality. A few pleasant surprises await us in life. The world that follows us is more interesting than the fact of our duration. The feeling of distance is quite... Okay, so, I mean, just to say one thing is I don't... I'm not convinced that the metaverse means anything at all. I'm, I'm with Elon Musk on this. To stick a television in your nose is not going to get you anywhere. But I do think the idea of a digital twin, in other words, of having a model that can use uh, AI to um, test out something is absolutely the way forward. There is, in, in China, there's a company that's producing what's called City Brain that uses a kind of digital twin to, uh, um, to uh, uh alleviate the problems of traffic, shall we say, to, to control the traffic in certain cities and, 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 and so on and so on and so on, all these different things. And already uh, uh, when you heard as part of a doctorate is, is look, looking at how you can use these digital twins to um, uh, to effectively test out the possibility or, or to design an architecture um, through the sort of simulate interaction of these agents. Now that's challenging, of course. And this is also kind of similar to what Daniel's doing with his... Um, PhD at Angavanta with, with Patrick Schumacher. Um, and we can expect to see this in the future that, that, that these um, simulated models are used to test out uh, scenarios and therefore feed into the building design process. So I just want to just this, I don't want to be kind of to, to give a, be a kind of a, a party pooper kind of thing by showing you some fairly relatively conventional architecture. But still, I mean, this actually Forget all those fantastic things. They're, they're amazing, of course. And we're all excited by those things. Possibly GANs will go out of fashion in very soon anyway because we, we got used to them or something. But I think the real impact of AI is not going to be all that experimental stuff, but this. This is Spacemaker AI, a company that's not as, as I wouldn't say, it doesn't use deep learning to the extent of XCool, but nonetheless uses AI. It's just been bought up by... Um, Autodesk for $240 million, which shows you that that's where the money is. Um, and even though this is conventional architecture in a sense, what is interesting is the fact that it was generated through a AI. And what is also interesting is that it comes up with scenarios that we would never have thought of ourselves. And that is suggesting something. It's a bit like the whole game of AlphaGo that you must have been talking about in terms of there were moves that AI was producing that no human could understand. Anyway, the computer is able to come up with much better better operations, especially when we're dealing with urban planning questions as opposed to urban design. Urban planning, which is essentially a strategic, a bit like the game of Go or the game of chess, it's about strategy. And that's where computers are way better than us and they can come up with solutions that we can't find. And this, in fact, was one of the projects that they did, which um, even though it's conventional, the way it happened, the way it was generated was interesting, and it came up with a, a counterintuitive solution that no architect in the room would have come up with themselves. But anyway, that's the way it worked. But this is the important thing, I think, that I would say in terms of the future of AI, and that is that already developers are asking their architects to use AI in the design process. It's a requirement from the clients. And why are they doing that? They're doing it because they want to maximize their return on investment. That is why they're doing it. This is the single most important thing that is going to transform architecture, not back to those funky forms, it's this. The clients are going to insist that you, you that, that, uh, that, uh, that architects use this. And it's a bit like spell check in some senses, you know, it's checking to make sure it's correct. But more to the point, you can see that down the road, once it knows our tastes and things, um, just as AI can can can, can um, suggest movies for us um, or uh, uh, on Netflix or or music on Spotify and things, it's going to be able to suggest building. I mean, it's way more complicated than either of those, but you can see that that's eventually what's going to happen. So, to begin with, uh, architects will be working with AI, and then the other dark side is to say, well, eventually developers will realize that AI is going to be better at architects than actually getting the getting getting the, the results. So. But that's another discussion. I won't go into that now. I want to talk now about the kind of question about <clears throat> about the process of machine hallucinations um, or the term hallucinations, which has been used both for 
um, the work of this is the work of Refik Anadol, um, uh, uh, based, I would say, actually, you can't see it here, but it's kind of coming out of a data set of buildings of New York. It's um, uh, uh, it's part of a series of projects they've been doing um, uh, for Arti 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 House. I think there was it was shown in, in Miami. Um, uh, and what he does, the term he uses is hallucinate. Um, it's a term that initially came from um, certainly from Google AMI. I heard Blaze talking about it. The term hallucinate has been used for how machines basically uh, generate these images. They hallucinate. So the question that, that comes up is then, well, okay, so how does that connect with our term for humans hallucinating? And of course, you get these parallel sort of worlds between the world of artificial intelligence and human intelligence, between machine learning and human learning. Uh, they're not the same, uh, but they are the, the similar terms are used in different contexts. And then the question is, to what extent do they feed into one another? Um, and uh, so I want to just explore that for a moment. Um, and I want to explore it through um, the work of Anil Seth. This is a book that came out, um, what, September, I think it was, uh, relatively recently. Um, and it's a bestseller. Um, <laughs> I really recommend it. It's about neuroscience. Um, and if you haven't got a chance to buy the book, have a look at this TED talk. Actually, this is an old fashioned screen um, shot. He's had 12 million views. This is one of the most astonishing TED Talks you'll come across. Um, and the thesis that Anil Seth puts forward uh, is a very revolutionary. What's, it's, a, it's been accepted now. Um, it's about the notion of what he called, would call predictive perception. In other words, the brain is locked into a bony skull. It has no information from the outside world, except from what are, are kind of rather um, disorganized electric signals coming in from the outside world. Um, and the brain is trying to make sense of these things. The brain is trying to get its best guess of what's going out there um, and to predict, to hallucinate. Um, uh, and, and this is the thesis, basically. Um, so I can't uh, play the TED talk because I'll get done for, uh, for, for copyright reasons, but this is a screenshot. All this puts the brain, basis of perception in a bit of a different light. Instead of perception depending largely on signals coming into the brain, um, from the outside world. And that's the way that we tend to perceive it. It's almost like the, the mind is some kind of camcorder just receiving this information, recording the sounds, the noises, the smells, and so on. Not at all. What, he, what, what uh, um, uh, Anil Seth says, it depends as much, if not more, on perceptual predictions flowing in the opposite direction. Like, what can I see out there? What is that out there? What, is I, what am I getting? I'm getting, I'm getting these, these electrical impulses, but what are they of? And, it's based on the data set of what you've seen before. You can only understand things through the through what you've seen before. And this is what happening is happening. We don't just percept, passively perceive the world. We actively generate it. The world we experience comes as much, if not more, from the outs, inside out as from the inside as from the outside in. And this is the thesis. If hallucination is a kind of uncontrolled perception, then perception right here and right now is a kind of a kind of hallucination, but a controlled hallucination. And that's the thesis, that perception is a form of controlled hallucination. There's the kind of error minimization process going on whereby you you think, can I what am I what am I seeing out there? What am I seeing out there? Is this a is this a building? Is this a building and so on? And it's being corrected through a kind of a process that is not dissimilar to what's called back propagation in AI. I won't go into that now. Um, but what I'm trying to suggest is these two worlds, uh, even though the term hallucination is very different, they're actually surprisingly similar. Um, and just as an aside, I would say that this already uh, was being um, commented on through the world of, of, of philosophy, of, of psychoanalysis, of, 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 of critical theory. This is Slavoj Žižek, the uh, the the uh, the Elvis of cultural theory, or the dangerous, most dangerous philosopher in the West, whatever you call him. I was at a conference with him. This is in two thousand eight. Totally terrified um, by the intellect of this guy. But his comment, basically, and this is an, uh, from an article that I published back in two thousand and two, um, is that basically we don't engage with reality. Our understanding of reality comes to us through the maze of the imagination. Um, we try and imagine what we're seeing. So fantasy is part of how we see the world. We fantasize, we're guessing. What are we seeing? What are we seeing? What are we seeing? 
Uh, and and this leads to this fantastic kind of comment that um uh, that what really um what a virtual reality tells us is not how virtual virtual reality is, but rather how virtual our understanding of reality itself is. Um, there's a book coming out with, by David Chalmers, who will be talking on digital futures in a few weeks, where he comes to exactly the same conclusion. Don't talk to me about the reality. We don't engage with that. We're guessing what's out there. The ultimate lesson of virtual reality is the virtualization of the very of the very true reality. So I won't anyway. I won't go into that itself. But what I want to do then is try and take these ideas and try and think, well, how can what can AI tell us about intelligence? And I, one of the things I would say that I came across, that one of the conclusions I came across in the book is that what neuroscientists and what AI experts are looking at is exactly the same thing. They're not looking for artificial intelligence. They're looking for intelligence itself. In fact, the term artificial intelligence, which was coined back in 56, is a very unfortunate term. Maybe synthetic intelligence is the kind of key question. But it's really what they're all looking for is intelligence. Um, and uh, so how can we use um, AI as a kind of mirror to try and contemplate, to think about what it is, what human intelligence is, and, and, and what in, how indeed the mind of the architect works? So this is uh, part of um, uh, chapter four in the book where I touch on neuroscience itself. And the starting point is this, is that if you ask any school kid in the world or any student of architecture or, or probably um and ask them how many colors in a rainbow they will say seven red orange yellow green blue indigo violet we all say seven because we're taught there's seven colors in a rainbow we're taught at school there's seven colors in a rainbow if you get six you don't get you know which that we're brainwashed into thinking that but actually when you look at a rainbow um oh, sorry. um when you look at a rainbow there's an infinite number of colors in a rainbow. It's a kind of, it's a complete spectrum. They're not seven colors, they're an infinite number of colors, but we're taught they're seven. We, are, we have a constructed understanding of, of the world that tells us they're seven. Um, uh, we're brainwashed, as we could say. Or you could take the word functionalism and you could say, well, what is a functionalist building? And most architects would say this or something like this. The Villa Savoie, uh, a, a building on Pilotti with a flat roof um, and so on. Um, well, uh, uh, if you come from my country, from the UK, you know that flat roofs are not functional. There's nothing functional about a flat roof because they leak. And yet we have this view that we're somehow, um, uh, we're, we're trained to think, we're doctrinated to think in some senses. Um, so what I'm showing you here is how we can visualize, um, this is the work of Memo Acton, um, who is a, a media artist also from Turkey, like uh, um, uh, Refik Anandol, he's now a professor at uh, UC, UC San, University of California, San Diego, and uh, he's been training a neural network um, uh, on different data sets. And on the left-hand side, you can see his you know, keys, his charger, and so on. On the right-hand side, you can see, or indeed a bit of cloth or something, on the right-hand side, how you can see how, what, how you see that based on the filter. Um, uh, on a particular filter. So this particular filter has been based on, 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 on the ocean, on rocks and things. This has been based on a fire and so on. Um, <clears throat> then we'll come to uh, clouds and we'll come to, to flowers and so on. And you, depending on how you train the neural network depends on what you'll see. And the argument would be that actually it depends on how we've been trained. We see seven colors in the rainbow because we've been trained to see seven colors in the rainbow. Now, that itself is kind of fascinating and extraordinary and so on, but what does that mean for architecture? So I want to show you, this is the uh, work of um, uh, Fernando Salcedo, one of my students from FIU, uh, who was also trained with, with Daniel. We had a session with Daniel to, to, on GANs. This is Cycle GANs. And he, he's trained a neural network on the work of Zaha. It's actually a, um, a scientific research center in Saudi Arabia that the images come from. And on the left hand side, you can see Daniel's wardrobe, his T-shirts and things. And on the right hand side, filtered through that neural network, just like Memo Acton's work, you can see how architecture can emerge out of this. And this is downtown Miami. There are two different, another neural network, and Fernando puts his tie there, and the tie gets interpreted as a building. Um, I th find this absolutely fascinating. What does it tell us about the mind of the architect? Well, nothing. It doesn't prove anything. It doesn't tell you that's going to happen. But almost uh, as an argument by analogy, it suggests the possibility that maybe 
this is how we're operating as architects. We're seeing the world out there. And then we are what I call architecturalizing it. We are beginning to interpret it in architectural forms. So you can take the example, for example, of uh, the Sydney Opera House, which was inspired by the billowing sails of the yachts in the harbor in Sydney Harbor. Um, and that led to uh, Utzon's initial sketch uh, on the, on the left-hand side which of course got changed as they built it and so on. It's not quite the same as that. It certainly isn't these kind of billowing sails. It's more these kind of um, <clears throat> engineered sort of vaults and so on. But nonetheless, you can see how one uh, feeds into the other. We take inspiration from the outside world. We see things and then imagine them as possible forms of architecture. Um, well, and what's interesting is when that, that, it, that works perhaps not so much in the world of just forms, but also in the world of concepts. Uh, you take a concept, this reminds you in something like the clip and VQ GAN, if you mention a word, all of a sudden you visualize it in some senses. And it, so the term, the fold in Deleuze, um, got interpreted by architects as though it's referring to architecture. It's not. I mean, it's a philosophical term. It's about ways of thinking, about the folding of subjectivities. I won't go into it now. It's got nothing to do with physical form. But as soon as architects seen the word fold, all of a sudden they start imagining pleated, folded matter and so on. Um, the same happens with uh, other aspects of this, the the, the term discrete, um, which for some reason, uh, I don't know why it is, um, is popular in the Bartlett right now. That, that uh, Gilles Redson sort of read somewhere that the digital is discrete and then starts thinking, well, that must mean discrete, discrete forms of architecture. Well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. And the, uh, maybe Mario Carpo is the worst of them all, where he, he thinks that he reads somewhere that kind of the, the big data is messy and then he sort of thinks, well, that's to be a style of big data. So let's think about this. And he has this chair also actually 3D printed by, by Jill Redson on the right and said, well, that's that's an example of um, of, of the style of big data, um, which, of course, is nonsense. Right. <laughs> if you're thinking about you when know, a big data, this is the model you should think about. It's about informational processes, not about form. So if you think about how an Uber works, you know, it uh, it's 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 it, it takes the traditional model of the taxi, but use informational processes to to make it much more effective. Now, if you if you look at a, an Uber car, is it any different to an ordinary car? No, because it is an ordinary car, right? Uber cars, ordinary cars, it's simply the way in which they the, the information is being processed. So we can't talk about the style of big data or style of, of, of information and so on. It's about how the information is processed in itself. But nonetheless, architects have this tendency to architecturalize what they hear. And of course, the, perhaps the, the, the biggest culprit is the term deconstruction, which is coined by Derrida. It's got nothing to do with architecture. It's an architectural metaphor, perhaps, but it's not talking about architecture. He's talking about how, uh, our constructed ways of thinking in the world. Exactly the example, perhaps, of the, the, the seven colors in a rainbow. Um, we have a constructed understanding that the rainbow is made of seven colors, but of course it's not. We have, in a sense, we're brainwashed, we are fed information, we are conditioned we are trained like neural networks. Let's put it that way. Um, now, there's there's a danger that you can take these terms, intelligence and learning, that appear both in AI and also in human operations, and somehow anthropomorphize them. This is a, a, a psychological experiment that was done in the, back in the 40s by Zimmel and Huber, who they basically, they asked people and said, what can you see here? And you, you can see basically there are two triangles and there's a circle and everybody in the experiment thought that the, the, the big triangle was bullying the small triangle and the small triangle was trying to help the circle. But actually, they're just shapes. They're just shapes on um, on a screen. But it's interesting how we as human beings tend to sort of read meaning into things. Um, and of course, there's the opposite. The opposite tendency is not to necessarily for humans to, to, to anthropomorphize technology but to technologize uh, human operations, to maybe to try and over invest, uh, to try and see that maybe the AI can tell us about what human intelligence is. So there's a real risk there um, in what we do. At the same time, I want to argue that there is, um, there is something potentially that can be learnt from this process. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that potentially, and this is only a kind of a potential uh, this is what I guess I'm looking for in terms of AI. Um, uh, the, the, what I'm showing you here is, is a simulation that was done by Craig Reynolds back in the 90s um, uh, called Boyds. 
And what he's basically doing here is simulating the flocking behavior of birds. Um, and um, But what was interesting about this is until this was done, um, ornithologists or bird experts had no understanding of how birds flocked. Um, but because he had to establish the rules on which to, uh, to, to for the simulation, Craig, Fennell, Craig Reynolds effectively reverse engineered that and, 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 un, and began to understand the process. Um, I don't know how he did it, but, uh, and that's my ambition eventually for AI, that AI or computation will eventually help us to understand how it is that humans themselves begin to operate. I want to wrap up now with a kind of comment um, uh, based on uh, going back to Blade Runner, going back to um, uh, <clears throat> to to Roy Batty, played by Rodger Hauer and and and, and Chrissy. Um, uh, Roy uh, Rodger Hauer tragically died um, in July 2019. He didn't live to see uh, the, um, the 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 moment in which. Um, uh, Blade Runner was 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 supposedly enacted in November 2019, but he did make this kind of this this comment, which I find astonishing. Uh, in many ways, Blade Runner wasn't about replicants; it, it was about what does it mean to be human. I would also add that he was very skeptical about the second uh, the second movie. He he did comment on Blade the second Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049, and he was very disappointed in it. And I too am disappointed in the second one. It's visually spectacular, but somehow doesn't have any of the power of the original one. But this comment, uh, in many ways, Blade Runner wasn't about the replicants. It was about what does it mean to be human? Um, and I want to put that alongside a, a comment by the Japanese roboticist uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro, who com comes up with this comment. The robot is a kind of mirror that reflects humanity. And by creating intelligent robots, we can open up new opportunities to contemplate what it means to be human. That's precisely my ambition, um, that we can get some glimpses into how uh, the world of intelligence uh, operates, uh, the how the human mind operates by looking at AI. And what I find hugely significant is this overlap that's going on right now um, between um, the world of, 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 of artificial intelligence um, and the world of, of neuroscience, whereby there are so many neuroscientists who are trained um, in computer science, like Anil Seth. Anil Seth did a, a PhD in AI before going on to become a, um, a, 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 a neuros a professor in neuroscience. And likewise, people like Debbie Sosabis or Jeffrey Hinton or, or a few others were trained in, in neuroscience before going into um, the world of, uh, of um, <clears throat> the world of, 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 uh, of AI. So there's, a, there's an overlap there. And I think we're in an incredible moment early in terms of the the history of intellectual life where we get this kind of this 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 kind of bringing together of these these different disciplines that are really opening up all sorts of interesting questions forget continental philosophy forget Deleuze forget Derrida although it seems that what they said has been borne out by the, the the more recent work what's going on now is a real leap forward in terms of trying to understand how the mind itself operates and this semester on digital futures we'll have a series of of talks by people who you probably have never heard of, but I trust me, these are the most significant thinkers in the world. And we're at a crucial moment when we're beginning to understand what is the, what is intelligence itself and what is the human mind. I'm showing you here, this is a bit, makes you a bit dizzy. This is the work of Edward Hyman, um, who teaches in Russia, um, he used to teach at, teach at Strelka, now at Mark. He's, um, and this is his endless skyscraper. One of, the, um, one of the many projects we included at the end of our AD, um, just illustrating the kind of uh, this kind of the the, the sort of uh, explosion of creativity, shall we say, that is coming out from this um, this particular world. Um, something is happening, and it is in the, uh, both Matthias and I um, came to the conclusion this is the first genuinely twenty first century design technique that is going to have a that is already having a huge impact on how we. As architects, we're going to be are, are operating and will be operating in the future. Uh, it'll it, it'll it'll take over increasingly. It'll be every my prediction was that by uh, the end of the decade, every single discipline, every single school, and every single university will be looking at AI. It'll form part of the curriculum. It is going to transform architecture and transform it beyond recognition. Um, 
I'm going to uh, leave it there and open up for questions. Um, uh, um, I don't know whether we have any questions or whatever, but I would be interested to know uh, what you say. Um, you are, as I said, you are guinea pigs in the sense that um, uh, I hadn't shown this to anyone before, and this is the first of a series of lectures going to go on literally around the world. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Thank you Neil. Thank you. Uh, can thank you, you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yes as usual but this is also even more kind of like i really enjoyed it because you had your time and it was a great lecture now i'll open the forum to any questions you can unmute yourself maybe so that neil can hear you so we have yamor she's asking you neil okay um, yes hi professor can you hear me yes yeah uh, first of all, thank you for being here and for your time. And the uh, lecture was great. So thank you for everything that you brought to us in our class. I want to ask you, since you've gathered all this stuff, and I've been following your research for some time now, since the BDS lectures and then digital futures. So I've actually seen a couple of the things you've been talking about in the evolution of the lecture. So I want to know what has changed your perception since you've started, you know, looking at the things you've you wrote the book and accumulated all this uh, great minds together. What is the change in your perception of the role of the architects now? And the uh, question. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, good question. I mean, first of all, so I, I the the first book was written mainly because um, <clears throat> there wasn't a book out there. So I, I and I actually was initial. The initial title was the book I was going to do was going to be the death of the architect. I was commissioned by Helen Castle, who used to be in charge of AD. Helen's amazing; she's a stunning, and I wish she was still part of charge of AD. Um, and and she said, well, "What was going to be the impact of AI on architecture?" And you know, I I thought about it. I read a lot, and I came back to her about a month or two months later. I said, "Yeah, I thought about it, and here's the title." Um, it's going to be called the death of the architect <laughs> she <didn't laughs> because she works for the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, and it doesn't. You don't want to tell your 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 constituents that, that their profession is going to die. Um, but it, but frankly, I mean, let's say it's not going to completely die. The other lecture I give on the, the dark side of AI called the Squid Game um, um, because it's based on AlphaGo, <laughs> right? And uh, which took place in in Korea, like the Squid Game. And and of course, it it not it doesn't not everybody dies in Squid Game. There's one person left over. Um, and that was the point I guess I made. And I was asking um, when you heard um, what was going to be the impact of of, of her uh, intervention with XCool. And she said, well, um, the moment effectively one person can do what five people can do. Um, and um, so it is going to have an impact. It already does. You know, and, and you go to any, you see this anyway. In the UK, you can go to a supermarket and you, you, you go to you self-service um, till, you know, you pay yourself. All those cashiers that used to have, they've just gone, you know, um, they've just gone. And, and, and likewise, you know, the comment I always make is, you know, when I was a student, you know, at the time, actually, when when Blade Runner came out, you know, you would you would uh, back in the 80s, you know, you'd you'd you want to go on a holiday somewhere or something or a vacation. You'd you'd go to to a, a travel agent um, and you'd skip queue up <laughs> and kind of like you'd you'd talk about your journey. Eventually, they'd, they'd produce something, then they'd they'd send you the, the, the ticket in the mail, then you'd go to a, 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 a photograph shop and you'd you'd buy these reels of film, which you would then you know take and then you'd come back and then you'd send them to be processed somewhere and so on. Now, f f uh, camera shops have almost disappeared now because everybody's got them um, in, they've got films in their, 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 their cell phones and mobile phones. Um, uh, processing things have absolutely disappeared. Nobody processes film anymore, I don't think. And travel agents are basically there for those who people who, who either want sort of personalized attention or who can't order online. Um, so I would say that and the other aspect I'd say is I think that in the end, the other, the, the, in terms of the squid grain mentality is that uh, um, the, one, uh, the one person that is going to survive is going to be the star architect in the sense that, um, of course, we can already now effectively, um, uh, uh, t t some Tesla cars are kind of pretty much self-driving, you know, but at the same time, on occasions, we will um, we will we will we will have a, a kind of a, a horse drawn carriage for a wedding, for a funeral or something, you know, and it's completely absurd. Why have a horse drawn carriage when cars are better and, and you can be self driving? 
well we do it because we want to kind of you know for the moment to show something off and things and, uh, and if you think about it then the, the same would happen possibly with star architects you know and you, you you would get them commission them just to go and to to in, as an indulgence as a kind of form of conspicuous conspicuous consumption because the point about this logic is you know in certain domains you might be spending more money but you don't care you, you buy a gucci bag not because it's cheaper but because you want to show that you don't even care about money you want to show yeah. it's a conspicuous consumption so you're going to get zaha is going to remain and and of course in other cultures and so on you're not going to seem to get this automation in some countries, I can't see it happening at all. But if you're talking about basically um, advanced Western society, I think that um, that the profession of architecture is is going to be transformed. But so will every other profession, absolutely every other profession. Um, we will probably find there. I mean, I think what I would just say to you, um, you know, I think as as as, as educators, you know, we uh, professors have a responsibility to tell you about the future, right? Or at least to <laughs> predict the future. And I would say, what are the the real challenges about architectural education is it's incredibly nostalgic, incredibly nostalgic. You know, you think about the, the you know, the, the curriculum, and you know, there are plenty of kind of courses and lectures on Vitruvius and on Palladio and, and Alberti. I mean, I worked in Alberti, right? I, I used the years gone by, but but nothing about the future. And, and you know, we are a profession that is actually premised on the future. Everything we do or say is potentially going to be built, you know, in the future, and yet. We are looking backwards. The model I often think about is a uh, um, uh, Walter Benjamin has a a, a, um, a, a drawing um, uh, uh, by Paul Clay called the uh, Angels and Overs, and he talks about it. Says this is a, an image. This is about uh, uh, the the it's a, it's an image of uh, of moving forward, looking backwards, and that's the angel of history moving forward, looking backwards. But that's what we do as architects. We're moving forward, but we're looking back at Vitruvius. We need to really think about the future. And what really astonishes me is that is that in other professions, you know, there are books out there that are bestsellers. There are bestsellers by the Suskins about how the professions are going to die. You know, how how um, robots are going to take over um, automation. They already have, you know. And yet, we as architects, if you look at the only book I could find anyway about the future of architecture, it was about oh, a hundred uh, uh, future of architecture, a hundred books. Like there, a certain sort of aesthetic was going to dominate things. Well, who cares about aesthetics? It's going to be ways of operating. <laughs> radically different so you know i think we've got to wake up we've got to wake up and um in terms of you you know i think for you for, for students today the biggest design challenge is not designing buildings but designing your own future designing your own future aware of these challenges on the horizon um so i don't know my advice to you i would say go to ai i mean go to fau but you're already there right do daniel's course i mean this is absolutely the future no question about it you know and what will be the future be I, well i think there'll be some kind of i think the metaverse will actually produce a lot of jobs um uh, and there'll, there'll be entertainment because frankly people have a lot more time on their hands um and uh, so i would be going into gaming into, into the metaverse and into into <laughs> golf and god knows what else but you know, I think, you know, it's I, I what I would say is that, I mean, I'm, of course, I I do have some preconceptions. We all have preconceptions, but I try to get into go into this area in a completely open minded view. And I try to just kind of to see what I could find uh, in terms of information by looking in other domains, looking in the world of computer science and, and all these other areas and so on. Um, and, and that's what I found. This is just simply what I found. And I would say that the absolutely most um, important lesson came out of a conversation that we had for Digital Futures, where I brought together Wan Yu He in, in Shenzhen in China and the guys from um, uh, Spacemaker AI in Norway, Oslo in, in, in Norway. And, and actually, strangely, they were thinking almost exactly the same way. I think the next school's more advanced in terms of their techniques, but you know, they were thinking, thinking the same way. And those, those two comments I showed you, that are basically that... Um, the computer was able to come up with things that we beyond our imagination there's a long discussion we can go into that but basically we don't know how dumb we are i mean literally we <laughs> don't know how dumb we are you know and i would say that however you understand ai i think you have to see that intelligence itself is a kind of broad spectrum in other words let's take something like the smell or or or, or hearing um anyone who's with a dog knows that's the you know, a dog knows that dogs have got a much greater range of smell or hearing than human beings. And and 
I would say that AI has got absolutely a hugely potential more, I'm not quite sure if the word intelligence is the right word for it, but certainly we are not the center of the universe. You know, there are entities out there that are going to be way beyond us. I mean, way beyond us. The problem is we don't even know that. We don't even recognize how smart they are. Just as in this game of Go, which you probably heard about, there was this one move that mystified all the all the all the experts. They were just they thought, you know, what is this? It's a mistake. One hundred moves later, one hundred moves later, suddenly it became absolutely clear it wasn't a mistake. Now we can't even think in Go one move ahead, two moves ahead, and it's thinking a hundred moves ahead, perhaps. You know, I mean that's my point is that there's there is there are things coming out there that are going to really put us in our place. And one of the articles I wrote was called uh, the second Copernican revolution, which is to say, if Nicholas Copernicus was saying that, you know, that the earth is not the center of the universe, but we, the, the earth goes around the sun, I think we human beings have got to recognize that um, we're not the center of the universe. If we all die off from COVID, <coughs> the universe will go on <clears throat> without us. And there are, there are forms of intelligence that way exceed us. At the moment, of course, the idea is that we can harness these as an extension of the human capacity. So. The, the term that's used is uh, intelligence augmentation or extended intelligence. We use AI to extend what we can do. Um, but eventually the time will come when um, when basically uh, it'll be more than us. You know, and you look at the self-driving car. Once you've got a self-driving car, you, you don't need a driver. Once you've got AI that can hallucinate buildings on its own, you don't need many, you don't need, you don't need many architects. So I just think that kind of, I think there are, that we need to think forward uh, and, and see what's on the horizon because there's something happening and uh, we need to adjust. And if these things are not taught in schools of architecture, then frankly, professors are not doing their job. And I would say that if any of you have not done a course with Daniel Bolliger, you should, you should. And I'm glad that Shamin is, is doing a workshop with, with, with you guys today. Um, Thank you so yeah. much for your time. I just picking up on what what you just said uh, i just want it's, it's interesting really ironic how um, going back to um, your, your mentioning of anthropomorphism and you know our own obsession with our own intelligence how this all began as a quest to kind of replicate human intelligence and in the end i totally agree with the, the all the last the, the whole the whole lecture of course but especially the last part where we found a way to bring it back to us by saying that AI becomes a, a mirror upon which reflect our own humanity. I don't know if, if that is selfish, but it, in some way it's it's definitely very interesting. So I'm kind of thinking that in, a, in an interesting way, architecture has always been this sort of um, hybrid between the technical, the artistic, the conceptual, and so on. And I think more than ever, you know, having superficial influences affect the way that architects uh, ideate now, because of um, this specific technology, which I think is definitely something we have to distinguish with something like parametric parametric uh, modeling, right? Parametric modeling was a tool, AI, uh, but at least the way that you have presented it is, is way more important. It's way beyond some specific application. It's something that can, it's a paradigm shift, right? And I think in a, in a true sense, it can help architecture really become cross-disciplinary by needing to bridge across uh, disciplines like computer science and cognitive science to help understand how we design, but not just as kind of external references, rather as embedded in the way we also possibly educated, right? Because I think, you know, going back, not not not, you know, in the in a dystopic sense necessarily, but I think the the curriculum uh, will have to change, right? It's it's already very very slightly happening, but uh, let's see what what happens in the next ten years. So I had a question, interesting, yeah, which was. Relative, going back to your book, you said it's already outdated, which is uh, funny, but at the same time, that doesn't make it obsolete. On the contrary, I think it's very important of that. But considering that you, you, you have this kind of duality between the black book and the white book, or the, uh, and you mentioned that you wanted to start by uh, talking about the death of the architect, and instead you wrote, you wrote the one about the positive side of AI. I'm curious, in hindsight, because we see now how interesting, at least a lot of things have been exposed to us in the last two, three years as to what neural networks can do, what they can do, and where they could possibly be going. Do you think that it would have been uh, a preferred alternative to, to, to publish the, um, the book on the dangers of AI first 
leaving up the open field to see what AI can do as, uh, you know, to, so to, to switch the order. I'm just curious about what you think about it. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> for, well, first of all, I would say that, I mean, um, that's the full title of the second book is, at the moment anyway, is going to be called um, The Death of the Architect, the, de the Demise of the Architect in the Age of AI. So my point was basically it's not just AI. There's a whole series. I mean, architecture is struggling. It is struggling, you know. And um, well, I mean, just to say that uh, in the UK, at any rate, um, well, you practice yourself for a while. Right? I mean, um, the, the, Alberti has a definition for the of the architect as somebody who is in, in charge of the whole thing, of the whole operation. You know, this that's what the word architect means. You know, it comes from the Greek, not from the Latin. This was the, the major step that Alberti make was to say, architect means the chief person in charge. I will go to a Greek lesson because you Greeks are better than that than I am. But, you know, but what's happened now is that already in the UK, most contracts are design build and the architect works for the developer. In other words, instead of the architect, instead of the, the, the builder being the, or the, the construction worker being the tool in the hand of the architect, the architect's a tool in the hand of the developer. So we're no longer in charge. That's first of all. There are all sorts of other things that can come into the, I mean, frankly, only 5% of buildings are done by architects in the first place. But, you know, I think it's already, we're, it's a profession that's already struggling, already struggling. And um, this is, in a sense, going to be, I wouldn't say the final nail in the coffin, but it's going to be something that's going to just going to make things worse. So. Um, that was that's my main perception. It's not just AI, but there are other factors that are involved in it. Um, but um, yeah, so the reason why I did the first one first was partly because you need to kind of come, something to comment on in order to critique something, but also because this the first book was was uh, you want to be out there for the first book, right? Um, and it's it's uh, it's also you need to get out quickly because it's going to be out of date very quickly. I was actually thinking that maybe you should have a kind of uh, a kind of Google document kind of book that could update itself on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, that's the way you, you, I think I'm sure publishing is going to go that direction because, you know, it, and, and there was 11 months that it took before we, from submission of the manuscript until uh, the final production. Um, and in 11 months, things can, can happen, change. They do on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's bound to be out of date. But I think the death of the architect thing has got, is fairly timeless in a sense. Well, it'll happen soon, right? But I mean, uh, uh, it's there's more there's more time and the more space for it. Um, and I also, you know, I think, you know, one of the things I want to do in that other book is to say, look, I, I think there are a lot of um, little work that's come out that is that is in a very kind of crude way that is uh, uh, critical of, of, of AI. I'm thinking here of the kind of the um, uh, surveillance capitalism by Shoshana, I forget her name now, um, and also there's a book called Atlas of AI, I'm just trying to think what her name is as well, um, and these are books which make a mistake in a sense, they, they, they look at AI and saying, oh look, it's, 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 you know, it's responsible for all sorts of biases, you know, but the biases come from us, right? You know, and, and AI is not evil in itself, there's lots of things you can do with AI, and I, to go back to the kitchen knife thing, but it's not it's not a question of the tool, but who uses the tool and for what purpose. So, you know, I so I, my my view is is not I'm going to take a different sort of line. I'm going to say uh, the real problem that is that it, how astonishingly powerful this tool is going to be. And I I, I can't give out arguments. I won't give arguments today because there's so many of them. But I'll simply say that the the time that it really hit me was when I was boarding a plane to to Shanghai in LAX. Um, and I came along with my boarding pass and I was, you know, ready to show it. And the flight attendant said, no, I don't need that. Just look at this screen. And it recognized me. It recognized me from every single other person on the planet. It recognized me. And at that point, I thought, holy shit. No. Uh, and so, I mean, it's a complex kind of question, but, but you know, it, it, I think the writing's on the wall. Um, so, uh, but the reason really was to get the first one out was to have some basis to critique, but also because this thing mm -hmm. is, is not documented or wasn't at the time and that, I mean, there are a number of other books coming out there's a book that um phil bernstein is going to produce which is going to be he's uh, from autodesk and it's going to be a more technical thing about you know how we use ai in the office um there are other things i'm sure there's going to be a deluge a deluge of books um yes for sure the book is in in, a, in one sense not outdated because if you think of the audience if this is meant for computer scientists perhaps somebody could say it's partly outdated but i think architects would have to catch up in terms of understanding every single aspect of what you're writing on because I, I going back to myself reading the manuscript before um i realized that as as you keep working with this kind of domain 
you 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 begin to understand different layers of, of, of how important that is or how so it's not about the technical uh, side of it it's about you know the the broader holistic outlook of how it can help us reflect on who we are as, as, you, as you already pointed out so in this sense it's definitely not uh, outdated because um, there's a lot of catching up to do outside of the research community especially even if we talk about professional architects or even students this is definitely very something very useful i also think that i think there is a um, i mean I, I'm a kind of, um, how can I say, I always work with Daniel because he knows what he's doing from a technical point of view. I mean, Daniel's amazing because he's also quite theoretical as well, but uh, essentially I'm a, I'm a kind of theorist trying to grasp all these things. And, you know, in some senses, I think the advantage, if there is an advantage to be a, in my position, is that sometimes you can abstract yourself. You know, when I finished translating Alberti, I was asked, Giovanna, Giovanna, uh, Giovanna Coralia, that's what her name is, yeah. She asked me to come and give a lecture at the AA, she's now elsewhere, but, uh, about Alberti. I spent like three and a half years translating Alberti. You know, I knew absolutely every word in Alberti, perhaps, I don't know. Um, and, and I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. You know, when you're at the coal face, when you're immersed in it, you can't sufficiently abstract yourself in order to kind of give a critical perspective on things. And maybe because I'm not working on the technical side of things, um, you know, I can probably get it. I have a certain um, advantage, all those all equally disadvantaged. And I, th I kind of think it's a bit, it would be the same as kind of like a, um, you know, with a Formula One racing car that there are there are mechanics who know, you know, everything about how the car works. Um, uh, but, you know, Schumacher or whatever it is, or whatever the names of the people now, I mean, they know how to handle it, you know, and you, you need to, so I, 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 that's what I think the advantage might be, but I don't know, you know, I, I just would say that I think this is an, an amazingly exciting moment because all of a sudden we're getting, um, <clears throat> we're getting these things happening. The AI is, is, is exploding. It's doing these incredible things. And I think from a theoretical perspective, it's super interesting. And I, I, you know, for a long while I struggled I, I, up until I think 2006 was my last book on kind of, let's say critical theory and so on. And I thought, and I was, that was my area, you know, Derrida, Deleuze, Foucault, and all these people, uh, uh, Butler and so on, what were they saying and how is it useful for architecture? Um, and I thought, well, this, there's something happening here because I was, was teaching in, in Columbia under Bernard Shumi at the AA, uh, at Cornell and, and Harvard, all these places and SIAC, very progressive schools. And I thought, well, rather than talking about dead French philosophers, I should be engaging with this kind of computational world and trying to theorize it. But you, I began to realize there's not much you can say about a robotic arm. You know, it's doing what it's doing, right? And you can't <laughs> theorize it. But all of a sudden with AI, you've got automatically the question of consciousness because the key difference between AI and human intelligence is obviously the fact that, that AI doesn't have consciousness. And there are all sorts of interesting questions that come in that, in that area. So that's the first thing. But secondly, I really think that uh, this new territory um, where you've got people like Anil Seth alongside Demis Sabis and, and you know, computer scientists and neuroscientists is absolutely the most fertile and rich theoretical debate that we're ever coming across. And there's a guy, for example, I really want to recommend some of these digital futures uh, uh, discussions that, that we're going to have in the next few weeks. There's a guy called Jeff Hawkins. Now, nobody in this room, I guarantee nobody in this room knows who Jeff Hawkins is. Um, but I can tell you, this guy is a genius. You know, um, uh, Rich, uh, Richard Dawkins uh, uh, said the book was brilliant. You know, and, and there's a domain that we've got to wake up to in architecture because architectural theory shouldn't be about Kenneth Frampton and God knows what else, learning from Las Vegas and all that nonsense, because it is nonsense, frankly. It should be about engaging with these things. And that's one of the things I'm proposing right now is that we should be a bit of a book that 50 years after learning from Las Vegas, um, we should be learning from AlphaGo. You know, that is, we will learn much more from AlphaGo than we will from Las Vegas. And and uh, um, so, so, yeah, I'm not sure I answered your question, Manas, but, <laughs> but yeah, I just think it's a, yeah. it's a very exciting moment. You know, I, it's funny because like some of my colleagues are retiring. I thought, what, how can you retire? This is the most exciting moment in the history of architectural theory. It's really fascinating. I don't know what the answer is, but there, all these questions are being posed and we're not coming to any conclusions, but there are enormously suggestive things that are coming on the horizon that start really uh, opening up interesting ways of rethinking what it, what architecture itself is. Um, having said, just having said all that, you know, I, I think also at some stage we need to go back and, and think about what is so amazing about the architectural mind. 
and you can criticize it. You can say it's architecturalizing everything, but there's something astonishing about that, you know. And I think one of the things that we don't we fail to appreciate is how immediate and quick we are as human beings in evaluating things. You know, certainly, I mean, I don't want to tell the students, but when we look at the portfolio, we don't spend two hours looking at the portfolio. We flick through it. We can see immediately it's good or bad design. You go to a cocktail bar in Miami Beach, you have a cocktail. One sip, you know it's a good or bad cocktail. You go to a restaurant, one taste, you know. And, and the human mind is actually very, it's a very astonishing sort of thing. So if we can think of a way of how we harness that alongside these amazing new technologies, I think we've got a, a new horizon opening up. So that was a long-winded uh, response. Thank you. That was amazing. Neil, I don't know if you can see me or hear me. Yeah, yeah. I can see you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now, I, I had a question similar to Yammer about the near future was happening. And maybe it's not a question, maybe it's a comment. Because what, what's happening, I think, and um, this VQ GAN uh, and CLIP experiment that you're showing us, we already experimented with, like Manus, myself, and Daniel. We were playing with these language-based models. And I think um, what's interesting is that we're always, in, in architecture, we're always trying to catch up with technology, with what's happening. And we're always, I think, a little bit behind. <laughs> and the problem with agency and authorship, I think um, what, what Daniel and Manus and myself are trying to push is the agenda that we, t we educate the students so that they have some kind of skills, the computational skills, the uh, skills to uh, at least start this. I mean, my agenda for them is before they graduate is that they know about AI, right? And then, and then the more they uh, interact with these models, uh, they, will, they will be more confident in customizing, changing and experimenting and researching. And on the other hand, we have architecture programs or in industry, that people are not even doing parametric design yet, right? They're not even in that space, right? They're doing more analog ways or more kind of uh, different kind of older methods, older ways. So I think the, the issue is that the, the, the gap between architecture and technology, and the more we're like VQ GAN clip and these open AI models, they were just released, right? 2021. And we don't see much work on that. Uh, we submitted, Manas and I and Daniel submitted a, a, an abstract that was immediately accepted because we're critiquing and we're in, integrating those models into our kind of agenda framework. And it was immediately the reviewer said like, this is a great kind of perspective because even the publications on AI, I think they're still experimental, right? If you, if you agree, I don't know, but it's more like we're trying to catch up with technology and we're in architecture, if we wanna catch up, we have to kind of leap, maybe take a leap towards uh, what's happening um, to, to, to try to kind of uh, maybe correct our way in, in terms of learning and, and using those technologies for our own benefits and to maintain our authorship somehow <laughs> so that uh, at least we become competent to, to, to develop. And we acknowledge, and I agree with you, that the, the, the discipline itself is changing and we have to adapt to that change, right? Mm -hmm. Just like the photographer kind of um, analogy that a photographer is now, now more like a graphic designer, right? It's mm -hmm. more like processing the images in Photoshop and other, more than taking the photograph. So I mm -hmm. think we have to uh, interact with these AI models. That's our kind of the way, the, the approach, right? Yeah. Um, and um, it's, it, it's sad that there is also some resistance, I think, like not everyone agrees on AI's importance, let's say. And also um, in, in our kind of Acadia and all the computational conferences, we see a lot of publications, right? And I'm really fascinated by that, but we still see um, the, this gap between what's happening in AI world and computer science and in architecture. And I, the way I see it is that if we wanna move forward, we have to break that kind of, or we have to, take a leap to diminish that gap uh, i don't know if you have a comment it's just yeah you know, just a yeah. couple of comments i mean I, I think first of all i would say that i i don't know if we're educators anymore i mean I, you know I, I i think we need to kind of really um find a new word um for what we do um um uh because we're, we're kind of i mean something's happening where 
where education itself, it's not about content distribution, because there's more out there, you know, we could find out more on TED, or more on digital futures than any one of us individually can, can talk about. So I don't think necessarily, but I think we can maybe guide or um, maybe that's what the word education means anyway, to lead, to lead or, or to point out things, you know, because it's up to the, in the end, the students to, to teach themselves, you know, we, it's not about us disseminating knowledge that we've got, it's out there already. So we have to take on a different role. Um, but maybe the example I could give was actually, I gave a lecture in Il Minkel, uh, School of Architecture in, in, um, in Romania, um, in Bucharest, which is, was the only school of architecture in, um, uh, in, in, in Romania. And um, they have some dinosaurs there, the real dinosaurs who are teaching, um, unbelievable. Um, they're, they're not all dinosaurs, but there's a guy called Dorian Stefan who's fantastic, but they're mainly dinosaurs there. I gave this lecture about, it was back in, I'm guessing about 2008, 2009, I don't know exactly. And I gave this lecture and about computation and it was about you know the kind of work that we were dealing with. It was people like Alisa Andrushek's work coming out and the early stuff, I guess. You know? And there was some guy in the audience who said to me, um, uh, because all they're all kind of curvilinear things like this, right? And then they said, he said, uh, but isn't the straight line sacred? And he thought, oh my God, isn't the straight line sacred? I mean, that was the level of doing it. Someone must have told that person that the straight line is sacred, right? Um, there's probably an entire class of the, the, on, on, the, on, on religion and architecture and talking about the straight line of being sacred. I don't know. But I, I remember that. I thought, what the hell, you know? And, you know, um, and you get resistance all over the place. And I was studied at Cambridge and um, <clears throat> there was a guy called Dalibor Vaisley who was so against computation that he banned the computer from the studio. So what did you get? You had a whole sort of uh, you know, graduating class that were unemployable because they couldn't use computers. But I want to go back to this. There, there was one person in that, in that lecture in Iominku who didn't say anything, didn't say anything. Um, and I found out about 12, 11, 12 years later, um, and uh, he came up to me and said, you know, I was at that lecture um, in, uh, that you gave at Iominku, um, and it changed my life. Uh, he was studying at Iominku, and uh, he thought, <laughs> I guess he'd been taught about the straight line being sacred. He said, I'm leaving. I'm going to, and he went to Angavanta. He went to study at Angavanta, uh, and then, well, he's with you, Daniel Bolijan. Um and that's my point is we have a class here full of potential Danny Bolidans in the future. And, and all it requires is someone to spark off the imagination or to trigger off something um, in, in the people in this, room, in this room to think about these things. And that's all my role is today is to kind of, um, is not to educate, but just to point out the obvious as it were, and, and to leave it over to you to decide what you want to do. Um, uh, but yes, there's going to be an, an amazing resistance to this. There always will be. Um, I know for sure there's going to be that. There's going to be people trashing this. Um, there are going to be people also from the world of, of AI who say, no, no, nonsense. And, and uh, that I don't really know because someone from MIT was saying, no, this is, what about what we did at MIT? Well, look, I did my research and what I could find, I couldn't find that any of the work from MIT Media Lab, interesting as what, had any real significance in terms of what's happening now. I think that people like X Cool, like Daniel Bolojan and so on and so on, they're the ones that are determining things and they don't depend upon any of MIT's knowledge and so on. There's going to be enormous resistance. But that's, that's not it's the main thing is to is to is to in a sense trigger off a debate. Just as I'm trying to trigger off some a debate in 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 the, the there's, there's in the class here to to really think about your future. I can't tell you what to think, but you can think for yourself. And uh, I don't know. Anyway, I don't know. I, I lost Thank the question. You. Thank you. Neil, we have uh, another student question, and I'm sorry we're taking your time, but it's just so exciting. <laughs> Matt, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, Matt, Professor Richard. This is Matt Craven. Um, I can't hear me. Are you okay now? No. Ooh. Okay, how about that? Maybe someone else could ask the question, or you could go to another computer or, or whatever. It's like there's feedback, no? 
yeah. This should be better, correct? Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, what I just wanted to ask is, is if we look at humanity as in um, the, the human species and intelligence as a sort of uh, process or an extension of um, certain ecological processes and AI as a, a um, sort of an extension of human intelligence, do you think that AI has the potential to, to predict or intel, tell us something about humanity from an ecological perspective? What was the first part of the question? That, that the humans were an extension of ecological processes? Correct. Um, I, I don't know whether I would say that. I would say that, I mean, I, there's, and I'm just struggling to remember the name of this guy, Varela, Varela, um, Francesco Varela, who's um, a, uh, um, a neuroscientist from, he died uh, tragically <laughs> early from South America, somewhere, I don't know which country, Chile or, or um, Argentina, I don't know. Anyway, he, he takes the view that actually what's interesting about the human species is that um, uh, our real problem is that we, um, is the size of the head. <laughs> I'll explain in a second. In a sense, when we're born, um, we basically, uh, we're not fully formed, unlike other creatures. We, we're not really fully formed. And we learn, once we're born, it takes us a while before we really adjust and understand, and we learn from the environment. In other words, the environment is really having an impact on us, and we are conditioned and nurtured by that environment. And I would take that view rather than saying that we're an extension of the environment. We're certainly impacted by and it has a huge influence on who we are uh, for sure um so yeah i and i i uh, so that would be uh, my thinking we are conditioned by an environment um and of course the key question ultimately is is how do you use ai for environmental purposes in some sense you bring those two worlds together and it's kind of interesting that just in terms of um you know the kind of key debates that are out there in terms of our DDES, we've got ai and and, and environment the two key issues Everyone's interested in that sustainability and and so on, particularly in, I guess, in Miami because of sea level rise and so on. Um, so the question is ultimately, how can we use these kind of computational techniques to model and inform the way we understand environmental behavior? And, and I'm sure we can do that. Um, uh, so I haven't, I don't think I answered your question. Could you just say what I've left out of answering your question? Or what have I not, not addressed? Okay. What was that last bit you said? Can you just tell me what have I not have I uh, uh, have I missed something in your question that I haven't addressed? No, no, I think I think that's I think that's perfect. I think that might be something that we explore as a as a class this semester in, in Shermin's uh, studio. I just wanted to see what your thoughts on it were, the connection between the two, um, the sort of ecological issues that we that we face, and then the you know future of AI and architecture. Yeah, I mean, they're the crucial questions. They're crucial questions. Um, Neil, I thank you so wanted... much. I just wanted to add relative to that whole notion of ecology, because you mentioned, you spoke about bias earlier on, which is one of the main problems in AI today. And I think what is interesting, I don't know if it's utopian still, but that at some point, if we get to, um, to the position where we design an AI system that has um, better curated data and the AI can begin to filter the data itself, then a lot of these biases can be removed. So from an ecological standpoint, let's say that the preservation of you know, the, the eco habitats and, and, and whatnot are going to overtake, let's say, uh, commercial or uh, profit-driven objectives. I know this sounds very far away, but perhaps this could be one of the positive things where AI intervenes in terms of ecology. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so there's a really interesting um, uh, interview with GPT-3 online. Um, and I'm blanking on the name of the person who did it, but it, it's, a, it's a fantastic interview. There's an avatar of um, GPT-3. And GPT-3 is kind of interesting because it's, a, it's, it's this, I mentioned it before, it's, it's OpenAI's natural language processing, massive computer, it's huge. And, and it, it, the, the, the strange thing is it's actually very convincing. Um, it can produce the most astonishingly convincing thing. You know, it can, it, I mean, that's the point is, is that there's one book out there where one chapter is written by AI and you don't know until the next chapter. Oh, by the way, that last chapter is written by AI. You almost don't realize how, 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 how smart it can be. But what was interesting about this is that in the interview, the, the interviewer asked, asked GPT-3, this avatar, are you sentient? Are you conscious? Now, it says yes. It says yes, right? I mean, 
So you think it's lying. AI is lying. You know, this is ridiculous. It can't be sentient. It can't be conscious because we know fundamentally that's one thing that AI is not. So why is it lying? Well, it's lying because what it does is draw upon this vast uh, uh, um, source of information on the Internet. And it basically comes up with what humans would have said. So humans would have lied, you know, in a way, you know, uh, so it's, it, but in order to lie, you have to be conscious that you're lying. You've got to say, I want to lie here, but it doesn't do that. It can't do that. And to, so to answer your question, I, you know, I'm not quite sure whether um, uh, AI could be itself aware enough to be able to critique those biases. Um, I think we'd have to step in to do those things, but it does raise interesting kind of questions. I mean, I think what I would also say that, the, I mean, that's, just, I mean, the question of consciousness is absolutely fascinating and even though we say that you know ai is not conscious the key question to my mind is to what extent are we conscious in other words are we really thinking about what we do you know i don't know if anyone's been to japan but when i went there i found everyone was kind of like bowing you know, that's what they do in japan and i ended up bowing back and it was an instantaneous reaction you know and i thought what am i doing you know and a bit like trump you know uh, saluting the North Korean general, you know, um, you do things without really thinking about it, you know, and, and stock answers, like, you know, someone says, good morning, you say good morning back or something like that, you know, there's a way of, of, of responding where we don't necessarily, so I think the key question to my mind is to what extent are we fully conscious as human beings? I mean, just to take the question about creativity, um, the argument about AI that Melanie Mitchell puts is AI can't be creative because it's not self-aware. It doesn't know it's being creative. Well, that is true up to some extent, but I would question when the kind of the, the design or the idea pops into the mind, you know, the kind of light bulb moment when suddenly yeah. you get a glimpse of something. Are we actually conscious of that or are we after the fact say oh that's a cool idea that's a cool idea you know so 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 i think the kind of question about to what extent we are fully conscious um becomes a kind of crucial issue but yeah so the idea was is that ai is not conscious and therefore it can't yeah. do certain things but I, you know i think there's another just i want to say that the, the um the first of the sessions that we're going to have and it's going to be i think the first sunday of, of february um who's going to be with david chalmers who is the leading philosopher on consciousness and um he uh, he's the guy to listen to about these kind of questions. Um, and I won't go into what to talk about, but uh, it's about his new book on reality. I suppose from a philosophical point of view, how can you talk about consciousness if you can't accept the, the non-conscious, the unconscious uh, component, right? Because going back to Poincaré, Hadamard, and others who have studied creativity, you know, that kind of moment of insight happens only after you have set a, cer a set of conscious parameters and then you let that gestate while you're doing other things and eventually you know this, this, this thing emerges so i think it's an interesting and complex thing to begin to discover what is the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious rather than which one is overtaken and, and more important yeah um i had a discussion with daniel <laughs> like last time i was physically in miami which was uh, uh last semester briefly um and and what i think is interesting is that um just over us over and above all these kind of questions we're actually not aware of everything in our body not at all you know and the body kind of filters out things um uh um i mean i'm told i'm told i snore i don't i never heard myself snore once <laughs> but i'm told I, I snore sometimes you know and it's kind of interesting how you filter out certain things and you know, we have the body has a way of dealing with things you're in a car accident you automatically you anesthetize yourself you don't even feel the pain and and i think what's happening is that there are a lot of things processes that we are not aware of and we're not aware of because the body's protecting us from all that information because if we knew about every single thing we would be there would be a, a overload of information so the body is kind of is i don't know how you would say filtering it or blocking it or whatever it is but there are things happening and often we're not fully aware of this and i think there are a lot of uh, of, of thinking processes that are we call them intuition or something, but actually they're based on, on really deep levels of thinking, you know. Um, uh, well, there, there's also the distinction between cerebral and cerebellar control, you know, which is about having, you know, using a skill that you've already learned without having to think about every specific step that allows you to replicate what that skill allows you to do. So I think this is kind of... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know much about that, but it, you know, just a simple question often happens that, you know, you're trying to remember the name of someone or something, right? 
and you can't, but then you go and have a, I don't know, a shower or something. In the middle of the shower, the name comes to you. You think, well, how did that happen? Because the brain is continually processing. We're not even aware of these things. So that, anyway, there was that I would say that Jeff Hawkins, the guy who wrote A Thousand Brains, now this is a book that you guys should read as well. And he's going to come onto this discussion. And he makes exactly these kind of comments that there is a kind of there's a kind of gateway or a filter or something. There are things happening of which we are not fully conscious, um, which is fascinating. It, it, it's got to be there, um, but we don't we can't really explain it. Um, so I, I would just want to say one thing is, is that, you know, I think that, that I was fascinated by psychoanalysis. I think <clears throat> Freud, Lacan, Zizek and so on. And I wrote this book, Camouflage, it's all about that. Um, and I think what we're getting now is a different take on the same question. In other words, you know, Freud kind of recognized there was an unconscious, <clears throat> but he didn't prove anything. There's nothing in Freud that's proven, nothing at all. But what we're getting now, um, and you've arguably neuroscientists aren't proving it either fully, because there's always limitation to what you can do in terms of research uh, exercises. But we are, you know, opening up something in a much more rigorous way, uh, a much more rigorous way. So all of a sudden there is a field of knowledge out there that is 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 just it's mind blowing to be, to be honest. So, so it's a great time to be alive, to be able to access all these new thinking. And it's beginning to tell us who we are as species. And I think all these people, you know, Jeff Hawkins and, and, and Jeffrey Hinton and, and, and Dennis Osabis and, and all the people and Il Seth, they're interested in, in, in who we are as human beings and why we think like we think. And now we're getting, I wouldn't say answers, but beginning to get some clues that might begin to suggest uh, uh, possible answers. And I, I think the question of consciousness is absolutely fascinating, but it's not at all easy. Um, anyway, no, but I, it's, yeah, I'm not quite sure about your question there, Manus, but. Uh... Thank you so much, Neil. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so thank it's, you. Neil, um, thank you so much. I don't know how much we can uh, ask from you in terms of time. You've been very generous and I know we have more questions. In normal cases, we would have taken you for lunch and we'll have an extended discussion. So maybe if you can come to Miami, maybe a midterm review, final review, we can have longer discussions. <laughs> the students are really excited. We are inviting you from now to our midterm and our final. The project is um, um, like I tried to kind of contextualize it within this frame of designing for future, a building that is not necessarily for humans. And that's why Matt Craven's question was in, in that kind of agenda. Uh, we're using AI extensively, um, multiple AIs, SALGAN, CycleGAN, fix to fix connected. We're doing uh, environmental performance evaluation. We're doing kind of um, uh, interpolation and extrapolation in, in using these models. And I think it's going to be exciting for them. Um, I learned from Daniel's uh, kind of advices, like how to do it. Uh, so we have uh, to guide the students through this kind of approach, like what we recommend for this design task, whether cycle again at this point or style again and all of that. So we have an agenda. And I think Matt put it in a very nice way last class. He said, okay, professor, we are prototyping a framework for AI, right? And I think that's what we're trying to do. And we don't know if it is really successful, but we have to experiment with it <laughs> to have it successful. So we're, you're invited for our mid review and, and final. And thank you so much for your time. If they have more questions, um, they will ask you in future events because we'll have you always. You've been very kind of supportive of FAU students who are learning AI. <laughs> and you have a kind of a group of fans in here in FAU, not just FIU. And uh, we really, really enjoyed the conversation and the great uh, presentation. Thank you so much for making the time. Um, thank you. Yes, do we have any more kind of final remark? I know Professor Vermisso, by the way, Manos is there. Yeah, oh, he looks like he's somewhere else in the world, right? He's just across the- I'm in the same space. Partition. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. I know Manos, if you want to say final words to Neil, thank you. No, I just wanted to thank Neil on behalf of our class as well. It's definitely been really interesting. We, Shermin and I are doing a different project this semester, but uh, my, my project is definitely concerned with the creative thinking. And for sure, I think you opened up a door about questioning what our creativity is today. And, um, you know, maybe we can, we definitely would like to, to have you as well uh, uh, in the I, future. I, you know. Let me just make a provocation. Um, and I, that is to say, was AlphaGo creative? 
I mean, was it creative in a sense? Like, I mean, it it was effective. It came up with an incredible. We have a yes here. We have our audience here are agreeing. Yeah, I mean, so the thing about this, <laughs> no, I think you know we have to sort of entertain the logic of the search. It was something I think you were referring to um, Mouse before. I think what's happening is it's kind of like a, there's a shift in what we call. I mean, not really sure we use the term design anymore because. If you just take the photograph, the simple photograph, this is something that, uh, that Daniel's mentioned before as well, but you know, you, we, the old days, you take a photograph, you would kind of line it up and you, you wouldn't know what it was. And, and you could take a Polaroid maybe to get a sense, but you wouldn't know until you develop it, what the hell you'd taken. And you'd line up and get the perfect shot. Now you don't do that. You just take a bunch of sample things and you, you pick out the best one, you kind of filter it through certain things and you, whatever, that's what you do. And in a sense, so there's a kind of search that's going on rather than design. And I think that's increasingly the way that we operate as, as uh, in searching, you know. And I think what happened with um, AlphaGo, it was searching. It just did a search and it came up with the best solution. Now, I my question then is, is well, and we say, oh, it was creative. What do we, what the hell do we mean? I mean, it's just like sort of, oh, I'm impressed. That was magical kind of thing, you know. And I think if you think about it, just take the term magic, there is no such thing as magic. There is absolutely no such thing as magic. If you go to a, um, a kiddies magician show, right, and the, the guy pulls a rabbit out of a hat or whatever they do, that's not actually magic. What's happening is you're concealing the operations so that the audience think it's magic. They think, oh, that's magical. You know, my concern is that that's how we approach creativity. We just simply don't understand the processes. We just say, oh, that's creative in the same way. Said. So I don't think that creativity is a, is a, is a very useful term. And it's actually a, a problematic term, shall we say. No, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying I'm right. But I think that we have to at least ask some of those questions. Um, and I think that for sure that, and I think this is again something that I'm Daniel- I'm thinking of Costas uh, while you're talking because- Yeah, uh, no, exactly. Yeah, he, well, he takes a yeah. view that, that just to say, just to those who, who don't know, uh, we we had a discussion with Wan Yu and, and Costas in a hotel in Shanghai. We were talking about these things, and he he picked up a plate of biscuits or cookies, you call them in the states, right? And he said he was holding, it and he put one of them behind his back, and he said, "Just because we can't say it, see it, doesn't mean say it's not there." So his view is all the possible solutions are already out there. It's simply a question for searching for them, and um, I, I have a certain sympathy for that viewpoint. I must say. Um, and I, I, just to say, finally, I, I had a, a chat with Andy Clark, who is a really interesting guy. Andy Clark is the guy who wrote about cyborgs, and um, he's actually a colleague of Anil Seth, and they work on the same theme of predictive perception together. And we were getting drunk in his place in Brighton on the seafront and uh, um, on whiskey, because he comes from Scotland. Anyway, and, and, and I put it to him, I said, you know, hold on a second, I'm not so sure that creativity that we... And he said, well, hold on a second, I will buy this idea of... Um, of humans not being creative. I will buy the idea if you say that neither AI nor humans are creative, or you can do the opposite and say both are creative. He said, I'll buy either one. So I you know I think it's really an interesting kind of question. I think creativity is a along with consciousness are, are two of the kind of key problematic kind of questions that we need to be engaging with. Um and I certainly will I need to I need to be convinced I haven't had an answer yet to the question of creativity that is convincing. I certainly know that we have an article by um, Lev Manovich in, in the AD, where he said that creativity was a concept that kind of uh, was coined in the 18th century. And now we have these these stupid kind of terms like creative industries. And actually, it's, you know, we never had it before. And it's actually highly suspect. Um, I, what I enjoy is, is, is when you get these people challenging our previous beliefs, like questioning reality questioning all these things. And, and that's one of the things up for grabs as well, which I find interesting and so on. So, you know, I don't know what the answer is. I think the important thing, and certainly for a, for a, for a theorist, is to ask questions, to interrogate things. I mean, because there is no obvious answer, but you have an obligation to keep asking questions. So um, I, I would encourage you to keep asking questions about creativity, because I think it's a highly questionable suspect thing. And, 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 and then finally, so sorry, the, the, I'd say that, um, and you know this, but the, the, there's a lecture online uh, by Demis Osabis, which Daniel refers to, which is a very good one. Um, I've also invited Demis Osabis to our, to our talks. I don't know if he's going to come or not, but we'll, we'll try and see that. But uh, yeah, um, anyway, 
But yeah, I mean, I, I think you guys are lucky. You've got you've got the three of them there: Manus and Shamin and, and Daniel. I, I it's one of final final comment. And I'm going to leave you because you've got other things to do. But what I find so amazing about Daniel, apart from his ability, is how incredibly modest he is. Now I, I, he passed through FIU, and uh, I was pointing out this guy's a genius. This guy's a genius, and they didn't shortlist him for a job, and you guys got him instead. But what is so refreshing about that is is because we, we are inundated with the opposite. We're inundated with people who claim they know certain things and are really kind of charlatans. Daniel is the kind of anti-charlatan. He's, he's embarrassingly modest at some points, crushingly modest, but super capable. So you have got a, you've got a resource there that you should make the most of. He is a very, very... Um, we are we're having Daniel next to class. <laughs> That's the best way. <laughs> I think Daniel's in demand all over the he place. He teaches right Monday, what is day? So we're having him every time. He has time for us. But anyway, he's teaching. Uh, yeah, for them the beginning of cycle again and uh, uh, fix to fix next week. Um, thank you so much, Neil. Yeah, thanks. Um, now I really thank you, thank you for everything and for the platform for establishing digital futures. I I will share with them any events coming because I want them to also kind of be engaged in that kind of huge area of AI. And also, um, thank you for getting uh, kind of this excite, getting us excited about AI with all your publications and the uh, doctorate program at FIU. I think you're, you're doing great uh, for us to, to get us kind of more in, on board in that kind of research area. Yeah, you're working hard day and night <laughs> for that. And it was really kind of you to to make the time for this lecture. I really appreciate it. They appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I, I recorded it, so I shared the recording with them and I also can share it with you if you want. But good luck with your next lecture. I think it will be great. So Professor Leach is, is giving a lecture uh, publicly in, in two days, right? Is it in two days? India, India. Okay. Okay, great. So we'll watch the, the other one too, yeah? Oh, no, it'll be repeated this one. Don't worry about that. But I would, what I would, I would say is that on Sundays from February onwards, beginning of February onwards, we are going to have these remarkable talks with the remarkable people. Now, uh, you don't know these names. Are they DDES series? DDES series. Yeah, okay. But these are people. The other thing I would say is, okay, so these are people who are mind-blowingly intelligent, mind-blowingly intelligent. They're not on their architecture horizon. If you find, if you just follow those things, so listen, buy that, um, uh, you know, Anil Seth, you know, Jeff Hawkins, Jeff Hawkins, A Thousand Brains, this book is, is will, will change your way of thinking about the world. I know I think it's important to, to keep up to date with these things and not just what I'm doing, but that it's already out there. The other guy I would point out is Lex Friedman, who has a series of interviews yeah. uh, with Elon Musk and so on. Um, yeah. Um, That's our agenda. For, for Sunday mornings, this is what we're doing, right? From home. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Neil. Okay, this is really not sensitive. Anyway, sorry for all the delays, but I will end it. And meeting for all.